Good evening, church. I want to invite you all to stand up and worship with us. Amen, amen, you are glorious. Uh, before we pray, before we start, I wanted to share an interaction I had 
this last week, I met a, a young man um, and he, he told me that he was locked up when he was 13 years old um, and he got out when he was 25 years old, right? So he did 12 years as a 13 year old. And he told me, I'm not gonna tell you the details, why I was locked up. And he started asking me, do you believe that a murderer could go to heaven still? And I was like, okay, I think I know what he did to get locked up. But he kept asking me, is there a difference in sin? Can a sinner still go to heaven? And I ended up, you know, sharing a testimony, ended up talking with him. I talked to him about the thief on the cross, right? That repented, Jesus told him, you know, you'll be in paradise. Um, so no matter who you are, what sin you have, I told him, you can make it to heaven. Um, and that's really what we're here celebrating, right? Thinking about Palm Sunday, thinking about Good Friday, right? Thinking about Easter Sunday, thinking about the price that was paid for each and every one of us, that no matter what sins we have committed, no matter what, what burden we might carry here today, no matter what we've done in our lives, we know that we could repent. We know that the price was paid for us not with money, but the price was paid for us on the cross. So we're going to celebrate that. We're going to worship. We're going to hear a message. So why don't we thank God for that, for dying on the cross, for our sins, for shedding his blood to wipe all of our sins away so that we have a chance at eternal life if we believe in him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to, again, come here to church, again, to see our friends, again, to worship you again to hear the message that you have for each and every one of us lord we pray that just during this next hour hour and a half that we're able to put everything aside we're able to listen to the songs and participate in your worship and give you glory for what you did when you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins lord so that no matter what if we believe in you we can attain eternal life lord be with us tonight we thank you um, that we're able to be here we're able to participate lord Bless each and every one of us. Amen.
Revelation 17, 14, it says, they will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers.
next song, um, God just put this message on my heart to say this before this next song. I was looking at the words and looking at what this can mean to different people. And today is Sunday, the beginning of a week. And after this, we're all gonna be going to school, work, family, and everyone's week looks so different. And sometimes we think that Sunday's our only time to glorify God. And when we sing worship is our only time to glorify God. But God gives us opportunities throughout every single thing that we do to glorify Him. Today we're gonna be talking about finances. Our finances can be for the glory of God. Your job, your job that you do, your job that you do could be for the glory of God. Everything that you do could be for the glory of God as long as you have that mindset of let me do this for you, Lord. Let me humble myself and do this with excellence. Let me try my best to do this as well as I can so that it's not for the people, it's for you, God. So before we go into this next week, as we're singing this song, think of what you have right now, what you're struggling with. It might be a temptation. It might just be your everyday life. It might be an addiction to your phone. It might be an addiction to Instagram. And think to yourself, God, I wanna give this up and use this week to be the beginning of when I glorify you through these things, glorify you through my work, glorify you through my finances, glorify you through spending time with my family. So let's worship him together.
Praise God. All right, you may be seated on your way down. Why don't you greet your neighbor? Give them a high five, fist bump, hug them if you know them. Don't hug them if you don't know them. Don't be weird. All right, so I'm going to uh, go through some announcements. First and foremost, thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. We want to welcome you to Spring of Life Church, Soul Church, our evening service. We want to welcome you if you're tuning in online through the um, live feed. We're grateful to have you join us as well. Uh, so this is our evening service. We have morning services. We have uh, Russian speaking services. We also have the English service. So we meet every Sunday, six o'clock. We welcome you back if this is your first time. Um, so I'm gonna go run through some announcements. We have a very special guest here today. So I don't wanna take all the time. I'm just gonna go through some of these quickly. Um, so here at Seoul, we have three ways to give. Um, as you guys know, in person, through text, which is my favorite, and then online through the website, through the app, um, three main ways. Giving is a way that everyone can participate in the church and the ministries. Um, maybe some of us can't sing like me. Maybe some of us can't speak with a microphone, but tithing, giving to the church is the way that we can all participate. Um, okay, let's go through some of the services that are coming up. As you guys know, Easter's coming up. Before that, Good Friday's coming up. Um, it's gonna be very busy here. So Good Friday service times. Uh, it's gonna be at five, six, seven, eight, even at 9 p.m. Kids, what time do you go to sleep? 10? <laughs> that wasn't a kid, that was an adult. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on, Easter Sunday service, same times. And of course, Good Friday, there's gonna be communion at the services. Um, Easter Sunday service times, 7 a.m., 9 a.m., 11, 1, 3, 16, and 6 p.m., the English service here as well. Baptism classes, those are coming up. Uh, for those of you that don't have the Soul app yet, please download it. There's lots of um, cool events. There's ways to register for some of these events. For example, this baptism class. If you're sitting here thinking, I want to join baptism, I want to get baptized, or I want to learn more about it, we welcome you to come to the class. You can register for the classes beginning on April 7th through the Soul app. Um, so go ahead and do that if you have the chance and the desire. Um, okay, moving on to the teens group. Uh, so today is actually the last day to register for teens camp leaders. So if you have a desire to serve as a leader at the upcoming teens camp, that's going to be mid-July. Please scan the QR code. Today is the last day to register for that. All right, and then I also want to share an announcement. So there's a youth telegram channel for the youth. Um, so if you are youth, you consider yourself in the youth, please scan this, scan this QR code and join this group for the Youth Telegram at Soul Church. They're going to be releasing event info updates through this Telegram channel. So please, we welcome you to sign up for that, to join that group. Which brings me to my next uh, very exciting announcement. Um, so on March 31st at 6 a.m., there's going to be an Easter sunrise prayer at 6 a.m. That's going to be early. But we encourage you, if you're in the youth, please come to this um, 6 a.m. sunrise prayer. I was told to make this announcement, okay? It's going to be very beautiful. Bring your Bible, bring chairs, bring a blanket. And the information, the location is going to be posted inside of that Telegram channel. So if you're thinking, I'm not going to download that channel, well, you're not going to know where to go for the Sunrise Prayer. So please download Telegram, sign up for that channel, and more information on that 6 a.m. prayer is going to be included there. Final few announcements. Uh, Bible Conference, I know we've been announcing this. That's coming up on May 24th to 25th. Save the date. More information is to come in the future. At this point, if you are interested in joining this Bible Conference, please mark the calendar. Mark your calendar so that you have the dates saved. That's going to be exciting. Um, okay, and now I'd like to welcome up our guest. So let's give a warm soul church welcome to our guest, Andrew. Come on up, Andrew. As you guys know, last Sunday, Pastor G talked about financial health in our spiritual lives, how important it is for our lives. And then Andrew here is going to be 
sharing how practically we can apply and have financial health. So I'm going to pass it on to Andrew. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. It's so bright in here. I didn't realize how bright it would be. <clears throat> so, as you just heard, my name is Andrew. You said Pastor G. You guys are abbreviating some um, A. Um, this is going to be a little bit different than your typical sermon. In fact, I'm going to talk about perspective, uh, perspectives. Earlier this week, uh, I think it was Tuesday, Pastor V. Vadim, right? And I, we had some tea and talked about that 90% that he was talking about the last couple of, uh, weeks, that this is what I do for work. Uh, I am a financial advisor by trade, been in business for, I'm going to age myself, 28 years. Um, and I do teach a lot of classes at various corporations, a lot of them are Fortune 100 companies. And so I, I offered, said, well, this is right up my alley. If church finds it useful, I could show the curriculum that we use. And right after a few minutes, Vadim said, you're going to preach on Sunday. I'm not a preacher. <laughs> Although my dad is, was a preacher. Um, then I remember that movie, Michael. Have you seen the movie Michael? It's John Travolta in it. How many of you have seen the movie? know what I'm talking about. Look it up. It's, it's a pretty nice movie. So he's playing an angel over there. And at one point, some people were expecting from him to do something like, I don't know, either a miracle or sing a song. I don't remember exactly what it was. He turns to them and said, I'm not that type of an angel. I'm a different type of an angel. So I'm um, different type of a sermon today, although... You guys probably heard that phrase, go and preach, and if necessary, use words. So all our lives, I think we are on stage and we are preaching and hopefully uh, pointing to Christ. So I'm going to talk about perspectives, different perspectives. So one, one, one of those perspectives, uh, uh, Pastor Vadim said that, well, everything is, is Christ-centered, right? Right. Then you're a preacher. So the Bible does talk about finances a lot more than anything else. And uh, so today we'll be talking about that. And in fact, I would like to have it a bit different uh, than just me talking to you or at you. You guys could ask questions. In fact, there will be a period of time at the end for Q&A. But if you guys like to interrupt me, ask a question, that'll be, that'll be fine. You might want to come closer. I could see you. <laughs> uh, otherwise, uh, I'll try to see and hear you. Before we start, I'd like to show you, how, I don't know if you could see that from, from the distance. Uh, it's, it's emotional wave that people go through in, in life, in different things. In, in, my, in my space, finances, before the pandemic started. How many of you remember that, that pandemic, that the end of the world thing three years ago? Uh, lines to buy toilet paper, yes? Um, 2019, even January 2019, market was at its highest. Uh, anything that you throw on the wall will stick. Then we heard about that China virus coming uh, to the United States. And then we heard that it's actually bigger than just small virus, but we had 14 days to flatten the curve. Remember that phrase? <laughs> so. Looking at, the, at this emotional wave, the way we, as human beings, feeling eventually, right at the beginning of this graph, uh, I don't have a laser pointer, that everything is good. There's no problem. And then as things come down, when we hear the bad news, we, first we, we're denying it, and then we're in fear, despair, and then we're panicking, and then catapult. We don't want to do anything. We grab our money, we sit at home. In fact, the March of 2020 uh, was one of the best times to invest, believe it or not. And I've been doing this for uh, many years. The other day, a period that I remember, it was 20, 
uh, uh, 2000, 2001, when that come bubble burst. So, people who were looking forward started doing something in March of 2020. By May, they doubled what they put in, believe it or not. It's crazy, crazy to, to expect that, but because the way we think, sometimes we act. So our behavior follows our line of, of thinking. Now, when we look at scriptures, without knowledge, lack of understanding, our people suffer, right? That's what the Bible says. So I'm here today, hopefully, to shed some light on a few things where we take emotions aside. We'll look at basic principles that exist, like law of gravity exists. Nobody would deny that, right? We might not believe, some of us, but it, it exists. Same thing with finances. There's certain laws exist in Bible, Bible teaches about those, and we're going to review some of them. But let's start with the basics, because I'm not sure how many of you have been investing in the past. In fact, why don't we do that? How many of you have been investing or saving uh, in the last two, three years? By show of hands. Okay, how, how many of, of you will not raise your hand no matter what I ask? Okay, just checking. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some basics. Uh, we'll c cover some basics, then we'll go some strategies, and then talk about tactics. How many of you know what cash is? Everybody knows what cash is, that? Even little kids would know what cash is. So if I heard that the sermon today, if you stop playing games on, on, on the computer, then next week, bring a piece of paper, sign off by parents, get 10 bucks. That's, that's right, right? Okay. So, uh, so we know what cash is. How many of you know what bonds are? If, if you were to try to explain to someone what a bond is, not, not the bail bond, <laughs> the different kind of bond. In Russian, it would be obligatse. Nope, what about stocks? How many of you could, could easily explain what stocks are? A show of hands? Yes? No? Two? Three people? All right, so bonds. Bonds would have another name, loans. And stocks will be ownership. So a corporation that wants to raise money because they need to grow, they could do one of two things. First, they could borrow the money or they could sell some of the company. So when they borrow the money, what they do, they issue paper called a bond and they will sell it, tell people that here's a piece of paper, I'll promise, give us your money, let's say $1,000, and in so many years, you could bring it back, it will give you your money plus interest, or we'll keep giving you interest every year until you bring, bring back your paper and we'll give you back your money. That's called a bond. A stock would be different where the company doesn't want to borrow anything, but still needs money to raise, to, to raise money to, to grow, they will issue a little portion of a company, another paper, it's called a stock, and they sell it. So if, if you think that this company is gonna do well, you go and buy that piece of paper, and then you sell it. Because if it's a publicly traded company, then there's always market uh, for, for your paper. It just be different than you when you bought it. Hopefully, it would be more advantageous for you to sell it later on because you bought it, let's say, at $1, you sell it at 2 So th those are the components that we're going to talk about, stocks, bonds, and, and cash, those kind of basic things. But before we do that, you know, guys, uh, statistically, pe people, well, let me ask this question. How many of you like to travel? How many of you went on vacation the last year or two? Okay. How long did it take you to plan for that vacation? Months? Weeks? Some people saving for a year. You know that statistically, people spend 
more time planning for their vacation, two-week vac vacation, than for the vacation of their life, the retirement, unfortunately. You, you could just look back at yourself at the history that, that you had, and, and uh, you, you will agree that we rarely spend enough time for, uh, planning for the future as we, we're planning for the, for the next, next day. So take, let's take a look at this graphic. It's, I don't remember what airport it was, maybe Amsterdam. <clears throat> I like to travel Bef before, the pandemic, I traveled a lot. Uh, after the pandemic uh, started, I actually went to Ukraine. I like to go to Kyiv about twice a year. I just love, even though I, I grew up in, um, in Georgia, we came to the United States in 1987, 88, a long time ago. Some of you were not even born. <laughs> but I, 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 I like Ukraine. Some people uh, that I know, friends of mine actually, tease me that you're not Ukrainian. <laughs> well, I was born in Ukraine. I was born in Zaporozhye, so I am a Ukrainian, even though I grew up in, in Georgia. But coming to Ukraine, it, it, I love it. It just twice a year. Uh, in fact, I was there uh, just a few, few months ago, and then I'm going to go again. But sometimes when you travel, you have short connections, right? And when, when you get to the, the airport that you don't know, we're looking for the map of the airport. We need to know where we're going. And then on that map, we're looking for that red dot. It says, you are here. So then once we know where we are, where I am, then I could find where I need to go to the next gate. And then, then if you have more time, you could go to uh, Sky Club and get some, some food and relax and a nice couch versus uh, a noisy airport. What I found is that the map is important. And it, even when you have a map, sometimes you still need to, to get there and ask for directions. The last time I traveled uh, back in January, I went to Rome. It was a little frustrating that nobody could tell me where the Sky Club was, Delta Club. I'm like, it's that simple, and that they actually call it the VIP club. That's why nobody could have given me the right answer. But I've been asking uh, questions from wrong people. And I ask people who uh, sell tickets, or at the store, you go to a store that will sell their different luggage items and whatnot. You ask people how to get to, to the right place. They're pointing the, the, the directions that that would not get you anywhere, until I found that I need to find someone who is like a police officer, or somebody who really nice the, uh, uh, knows the airport, is a big picture, not just next door. So we need to, when we ask for advice, we need to ask the right people. So that, that was the point of this. And sometimes that red dot, we don't know where we are. In, in the world that I am, uh, we help people to identify where you are. Just take an inventory. Take uh, a, a worksheet that puts um, all the categories of your budget, and you know how much you're spending, how much you're earning. So at the, at the end of the month, you're not in neg negative ter territory. Territories. Just by going through that exercise, could be an aha moment where you could see how you, you spend your money. So many people, clients of mine, were telling me that as they go through the workshop, uh, worksheet, they identify how much they spend on coffee, for instance, in Starbucks. Buying a cup of coffee in the morning and a cup of coffee at, at lunch, multiply times 20, 25, depending on how many days you work. That's a lot of money. Might as well buy a machine that does that nice, tasty coffee, right? And risk assessment. By asking some questions, you could identify how risky are you as, as an investor to invest and take, take different steps. But what I found that even once we know this, we need to take a complex world of investment and try to simplify it. So what, one of the ways to, to simplify it is to think like what everything that we have could be spread in three different places. 
We have a safe place, moderately aggressive, that doesn't have a lot of volatility, and aggressive. Safe place, I would say that we would make a list of everything that we could think of that we would like to achieve in the next three years. Just take an inventory, write it down. Because again, if, if you don't write it down, you're just dreaming. Once you start writing down, you, you, you're planning. So I want to buy a car, I'm going to go on vacation, save money for emergency, for rainy day. Anything that you could think of that you'd like to achieve the next three years, that money should not be invested anywhere. Not buying bitcoins, Tesla, anything. This should be in cash. Because the point of that money is not to get a return on your money, but return of your money when you really, really need it. But once you save that in, in the first bag, you're done. Now you could save in this bag number two, bag number three. Bag number two, again, you make an inventory, anything that you'd like to achieve in the next seven years, three to seven. That could be, I don't know, maybe uh, buying a second house, maybe something else that you plan to achieve. Again, the money that you'll be using in the next three to seven years should not be invested in the highly growth-oriented places because that comes with volatility. But we still need to have a little bit higher return than regular savings account will give us. Although nowadays, the savings account will probably give you 4 or 5%, depending on the bank of your choice. But we need, again, to have access to money. And the last one, that would be your legacy, your retirement, anything else that you want. You could invest in any risky places. But what happens is that the animation, by the way, is not working on this. So, but it's still, still try to make a point. Whatever happened in 2020 in pandemic, when the market went down by 40%, if you had your money separated like this, and you have cash that you plan to spend the next three years, we don't care what happened in the marketplace because we have the money right now. We could buy the toilet paper, whatever we need to, to buy, and buy food. And now, three years later, four, four years later, how many of you are still worried about pandemic? No. So we live through that, and it's like musical chair, the, the bags are shifting. The, the one that was a very long term moved to, to midterm, midterm to move to, to cash. If we spend cash, it sometimes happens that we spend our cash, and well, then we replenish either from savings again or from another, another sources. The long-term bag, if, if you were to look at it, could be separated into two areas, pre-tax and after-tax. We'll talk about that as well. Pre-tax, that will be all your pension plans, 401ks, IRS of the world, and after-tax, everything else. Any investment that you could think of, real estate, buying, uh, buying cars and selling, whatever you are in, that will be an after-tax, where you will be paying taxes on a profit once you sell it, and on the pretext, you just keep it until you retire. If you sell it early on, you're not only going to pay taxes on everything, plus penalties for early distribution. So by taking that assessment, if you are one of those people that say, well, I am able to put about 70% of my money for growth into, into growth position accounts, and 30 will be in my moderate, then you will take a look at your bags and say, well, this is my split. If you're following the market and you see how it is volatile and market goes up, we want to join the winning team, the market goes down, <laughs> we're stepping back. Then it goes kind of against what Warren Buffett said, buy low, sell high, because we're doing that, the opposite. We want to buy when everybody is buying it because it's so popular, you're buying at premium. And then we're selling one, we're panicking. To avoid that pitfall, so we're not buying when it's expensive and selling when it's inexpensive. With houses, we'll, we have no problem with that. We buy a house for whatever, let's say 500000 and it dropped down to 400000 We're not going to panic and say we lost $100,000 right now. No, we'll just steal the same house, right? Still the same. It's just if we were to sell it, the demand is such that 
we're going to lose on it. Or the opposite, if the house that you bought at 500,000 and now it's traded or being selling at 600, nobody just writes you a check for 100,000 and deposits to your bank because it appreciated. It just says that if you were to sell it, well, then it's worth now 600,000. So then you will profit. But with investments in the marketplace, other than real estate, most people don't think that way. They still think in dollars. Market goes up, we want to invest. Market goes down, we don't want to invest. To avoid that, let's keep the ratio. So if, if you keep 37-year ratio and, and things start changing, by just adjusting the ratios, if one goes up, the other goes down, you automatically sell high and buy low. So in this case, your 70 went up to 90 because it went up, so collectively, it gives you 100% of everything that you invest, well, we just shave it off, the profits. By fixing it, we're moving out of equities into bonds. And it's the opposite. When bonds go down or go up, we still adjust the ratio towards the equities. So the long-term perspective, if you look at regular investments, no matter how volatile the world is, is still going up. There's, not, there's no investment out there that went down, it stayed down, unless it's something that they don't manufacture anymore. But a typical blue chip company or a mutual fund for beginner, beginner investors, it, it goes down and it goes up. We just we don't know when th that will happen, but over time it ratchets up. If we keep adjusting the ratio, then what happens is that our curve, it tilt towards the return increases significantly just by adjusting the ratios. And at the same time, we are not putting everything that we have at risk. Now, when we do not have these three bags physically and uh, in our head separated for cash, midterm and long-term investments, and we spend our money for unexpected things that might happen, uh, your car breaks down, you, you break a leg or something happens, we spend our cash or pandemic happen, right? Th then what do we do? Well, we panic. If we take a look at the accounts that went down, let's say you had a mutual fund or a stock account and market went down, but you still have cash, well, you sleep well. If you don't, you, you, don't, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And I've, I've seen where people work calling my office saying, well, we're not your clients, but we don't know what to do now. Just tell us, look, first, I don't know. I can't prescribe you medication over the phone like none of the doctors would. <laughs> you expect me over the phone to give you that type of advice. But again, panic and stress and not knowing what to do uh, sets in when you're not pro uh, planned properly or, and like I mentioned, separate your cash for short-term needs bonds for moderate and yeah, medium or three to seven uh, year length and the rest of it for, for, the, for, uh, for, for your retirement and um, legacy. Now talking about perspective, my grandma, my dad's grandma, uh, she's no longer uh, with us, she died about 10 years ago. When my dad was, I don't know, probably like once one of you guys, about 20 years old, <laughs> lived in Rostovsky Oblast, Gorod Shachty, he said that as he was trying to build a house, she was walking around him, walking around him, said, what are you doing, son? What are you doing? The Lord is coming. Yeah, the Lord is coming. We just don't know when. And that was 70, 60 years ago. <laughs> So again, yes, everything is Christ-centered. We, we live every day like it's the last day of our life, but we still need to plan. That's why the Lord gives us wisdom and discernment what, what to do. About uh, 15, no, maybe 20 years ago, uh, it came to me an idea, it was actually after the uh, dot-com bubble burst, is that we should have a strategic plan and some type of a model that will help us to to build our financial house. 
when you guys uh, see people build houses, where do they start? Foundation. Well, they actually start with the blueprints, right? They have blueprints, but once you open the blueprints, you see an aerial plot, then you have foundational, then you have structural, electrical, roofing, and so, so on. But everything starts with foundation. The stronger the, uh, the foundation, the taller the building. If you build your house on the rock, then it will stand, right? If you build on the sand, it's not. Yeah, everything is Christ-centered. But let's talk about what goes into your foundation. So again, imagine you're building a house. You want to build the strongest foundation as possible. The first few things that we need to pay attention to, again, especially for young families, is make sure that, that the bases are covered, like your health insurance and long-term care insurance. The health care in this world is, well, in this country, is so expensive that you could be saving money in cash, not putting money at risk, uh, keeping under the mattress for 20 years, then go visit a doctor and everything <laughs> goes out of the window because of how expensive it is. And it's not just humans, even our pets. I, took, I have two Doberman uh, dogs, and one of them was limping. I, I took him to a hospital yesterday, and I said, we need to do an x-ray. By the way, the x-ray is $450. <laughs> Imagine if there's a surgery. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's very expensive. I need to make sure that it's taken care of. Next two would be emergency savings and debt management. We already talked about emergency savings. I would say that... Uh, any book that you would read on personal finance would recommend you to have it from three to six months of your budget that you use saved up. And if you're self-employed, might even have more than that. Again, not invested, saved up, somewhere where you could have access to your money. Either cash or cash equivalent. And uh, the next one that is debt management. The Bible talks about debt as well. Uh, many, many examples of that uh, that will become slaves to someone who, who has uh, indebted us. But imagine this. We want to fill this with, with water or something, but there's a hole in here. And so we're dripping, let's say, at the rate of one, but comes out to the rate of five. Mathematic, mathematically, is it possible to fill it? No. The easiest way to fill it is plug the hole. Right? So, debt. There's a good debt, I would say, and there's not so good debt. <laughs> so, what would be, could be named as a good debt? Mortgage. Yeah? Why is it good debt? Not expensive and deductible, right? Again, putting things in perspective. Are we living in a high interest rate environment or low interest rate environment? Pretty high. In Right? For those people who experienced 3% or 4%, let's put things in perspective. In 1987, when we came to the United States, well, actually beginning in 88, we lived in Baltimore, Maryland, and like any families, young families, we want also to buy a house. Guess what was the interest rate? 18 so, we grew up in Georgia, so I never called myself a Ukrainian that time, because the Soviet Union, everybody's Russian, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, but my dad's from Hmelnytschina, so we went to Ukrainian Spilka. And because we're Ukrainians, they gave us 17%. <laughs> so, uh, again, the... Perspective changes once you, there's a, a way to, to comp compare with. So mortgage is, is a good debt because you could do that, but using credit cards to uh, finance your vacation and then paying for, for the next three years that they're off is not a good debt. Right? So we need to make sure that we don't have the, uh, just don't have it in that, that area. All right, so next to wills and trusts. In fact, we actually have a separate class that's an hour long to talk about wills and trusts. How many of you could tell me the difference between a will and a trust? I'll put you on the spot. Let's. I got a mic, so I'm, I'm lucky. Uh, will, you know, when, when parents are aging, they create a will. So when they die, the family knows or the attorney knows, financial advisor, um, what to do with 
you know, the property, the assets, bank accounts, cash cards, whatever it may be. Um, trust could be a living trust. There's many different trusts, um, but you put all your assets in that trust, and then uh, it's kind of another layer of protection for you as well. Um, and then when parents pass away, they, if it's a living trust, um, all the assets go to the kids through that trust. So there's a lot of tax benefits through those. Um, so that's a little bit about wills and trusts. A lot of people think of trust like things that protect you from everything. <laughs> no. So a smart attorney could uh, um, uh, open the trust in one way or the other. But it helps with transfer of assets mainly. Although there are trusts that protect from liabilities, uh, it, 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 but it's not the regular trust, it will be irrevocable trust. But to kind of distinguish uh, two, uh, two uh, one from another one, it will, it's a set of instructions. If you need to pass on an item to somebody else that does not require your signature, a, tr a trust will suffice. In fact, every one of you could, uh, I mean, a will will suffice. Every one of you could write a will. It's called a holographic will. If you write by hand, don't type it up, write by hand, allegedly I'm in the right mind, writing my last instructions, so you write everything and sign a date, it's good. In the state of California, it's good. If you type it up, you have to notarize it, 10 bucks. A trust is when you're passing something to another person where your signature is required. Let's say you say, my house is gonna go to my kids. Pretty clear, right? The instructions are there. But once you die, we all die eventually, hopefully later uh, sooner. They un people who will read it, that they understand, but how will they, they uh, take possession of the deed? Because you need to sign off. Or it's like a car or a bank account. Even though you might have a will, a clear set of instructions telling you exactly what to do. But it's impossible because you need to be there to sign. Because I'd be weird if you could still sign when you're dead, right? So when you have a trust, you take it, your name off everything that you own and put the name of the trust. Now you own nothing, but you control everything. The trust is the document that owns it, but you're directing, you're the manager of the trust, you're the trustee. There will be another person, another person, your spouse, and maybe another brother or sister could be another person who in line to be trustee if something happens to primary or secondary trustee. Okay, so it will set of instructions, Trust is something where you want to pass on to somebody else that requires your signature. And you especially we have minor kids. What trusts often do, they collect everything. They will then uh, find, uh, you write down the, the, who will be the guardian and how money will be distributed. Because what happens when young kids, until they uh, turn 18, they cannot have anything out of your estate. Once they're 18, they get everything. How many of you the adults now, think back when you were 18, let's say you received 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 dollars all at once. What would you do with the money? Buy a red sports car, probably, right? And burn it. So, you could specify how money will be distributed. Some at 25, some at 30, go finish school, and, then, and so forth and so forth. You could specify to many, many, many different uses, right? Again, part of the foundation. All right, moving on. Auto insurance, homeowners insurance, just property. And this day and age in the state of California, you must have an auto insurance. And if you have a mortgage, they have to have uh, homeowners insurance. If you're renting, you might still want to have a renter's insurance. Because let's say there's a, a theft happened or a fire, and you make a claim. Well, if, if you, even if you had insurance, the adjuster will come in, and is that adjuster working for you or working for insurance company? For insurance company, right? So it will be harder to prove what you have in value if you don't rec uh, take uh, inventory, take pictures, but even to have it. Sometimes people complaining that, well, what kind of country that doesn't take care of the, its own citizens? Well, you had an opportunity to buy bef beforehand. So once you fill off the plane, you don't start shopping for a parachute, you should have had it beforehand. And as strong as you think you would need to have there. Now, one of the items that rarely being discussed by agents who provide auto homeowners insurance is umbrella liability. How many of you know what umbrella liability is? By show of hands. 
one person, two in the back, okay? So umbrella liability is the extension of regular liability. So if you, let's say you have really good coverage, 100,000 per person, 300,000 per, per occurrence in auto, automobile, auto insurance. You get in an accident, it's your fault, okay? Yeah, hopefully it won't happen, but if it did. And the person that you hit claims that besides damaging the car, he or she cannot work anymore. And they're 25, 30 years old, making 50,000, 100,000 a year. Do you think $100,000 coverage will suffice? They'll be happy with it. Most likely not. They will fi find a smart attorney and say, well, yeah, so the, the first coverage that the insurance policy gives, we're going to take it up, obviously. But then we'll sue you civilly to garnish your wages to get the rest of it. Then your retirement plan just became somebody else's retirement plan. To avoid that, we're looking into getting extension of liability. If you go back and say, well, instead of 100,000, 300,000 coverage, let's increase the half a million to a million. Well, then you're double and tripling your premium. Or you could get a stack on policy called umbrella liability, and that give, goes in million to in, in so, and that might cost $20 a month, maybe 25. First million, next million, maybe only $5. So you, I would encourage you, if it's important to you, uh, to pr get uh, that liability extended, call your agent. By the way, the umbrella is not attached to a car, attached to you as a person. So any, anything you do anywhere, if somebody uh, sues you civilly, it will, will protect you. That could, could be anything, even uh, in, in Clinton's case, who, who remembers that president. He did certain things that cannot be repeated from, from the pulpit, but his liability insurance did cover a lot of it, All right? So, Travel contributions, that's your 10%. Love the farm, right? So if we were to support our favorite charity, that could be church or Red Cross, and it would be beyond, beyond your life, if it's important, then cre create trust that will, will uh, keep funding your, your favorite charity even beyond your life through life insurance trust. And the last two, I will, almost done, it's you. If you're not there, if you're not alive, you're not able to work, everything comes to a screeching halt. So life insurance, disability insurance must be in place before you die, before you get sick. In fact, with all of the foundations, the common theme there is the only time you could get all those when you don't need them. Because when you need them, you can get them. So think, think ahead and, and uh, plan properly. Younger age, we want to build the houses where we could invest more in the higher risk and we'll cover that uh, if we have an additional class expanding on this. M middle age, we have less at risk and obviously as we uh, closing to, uh, going to, towards retirement, then we keep more money in conservative place and not so much in equities. Now if you squint and look at this, there's a hidden message in, in this graphic. Can you tell what it is? Okay, how about now? <laughs> there's foundation, there's cross. In fact, the foundation, I came up with this idea a long time ago, uh, and Fortune 70 company actually uses to train their agents, believe it or not. And the top portion was done, uh, put together by a friend of mine, um, who he said that it came to him in a dream, as a, as a cross. So, like I said, everything is, is uh, Christ-centered. Now, I'm going to leave you with, with, with this message, with, and uh, then I'll open up for Q&A if, if you like. Uh, but I'm so glad that uh, Pastor Vadim in, invited me over, because I see everything that's been done by your leadership is pointing towards Christ and to take care of people here, and people back uh, in our own country. Now, if you pull out your, your phones and point to this uh, QR code, it would be an opportunity for you to uh, tell us if this is something you'd like to
to see on a regular basis if you really like these type of uh, educational uh, classes and workshops. And if you'd like to ask a question offline, because I'm going to open up the floor for, for Q&A quickly uh, if we have time. But there are some people that will not be comfortable asking a question in the group environment. So for those of you who would like to ask me a question offline, uh, point to QR code uh, and it gets you to evaluation of, the, of, uh, of this educational workshop and gives the opportunity to ask a question. In fact, if you like to ask questions, uh, in my office in the month we're going to have a forum where we have an estate planning attorney, a tax person, a loan officer, a mortgage specialist, a realtor, and myself an advisor, we're going to have a, a forum where we sit in front of uh, everybody and just take questions on any topic that people would like to have. So if, if something um, like this is of interest to you, go ahead, uh, take a look at it, take a picture uh, in, in that uh, QR form, you could, uh, you could ask for more details. So I'm opening up, up the floor and you, you could tell us if, if anyone um, would like, like to ask me a question. Yes, I ran over a bit. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, financial questions, um, please raise your hand. I'm happy to bring a mic over. I see someone back there. While I'm walking over there, Andrew, question for you. Um, if somebody is a teenager or somebody is in youth still living with their parents, right? So they don't have a home, they don't have maybe a car's insurance. Um, what, what's the best, where's the best place to put their money if they're, I don't know, 18 to 23 living at home? Okay. So get in the habit of saving. Uh, you probably know there are two types of people out there. One type of people, uh, group of people that you can see they, they make money, they, uh, their salary is not that high, but it seems like they always have money. And other people come and borrow money from them. And then you see another group of people that make a lot of money. You know that they make a lot of money. But towards the end, they, uh, at the end of the month, they can, can seem to finish that month. They, they're going to credit card debt. And the difference is the order of spending. Those people that get paid and save right away something for themselves, they always have money. Those people that get the money and pay everybody else first, like pay the bills, pay the mortgage, pay the, towards the end they don't have enough money for themselves. And no matter how much the income increases, that strategy is still the same. The, towards the end of the, the month, they don't have enough money. So strategy for young people, learn to save. As soon as you get a dollar, or $10 if you're not playing Nintendo, whatever games you're not going to play. 10% goes to church, 10% goes to you, live on 80. If you keep that habit going, every time you get paid, take something and save before you spend it. Then no matter how basic or advanced strategies become in the future, you'll always be successful. Thank you, Andrew. Yes. Back here, back right of the building. Um, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is George, and I was just wondering, so I have a lot in my savings, but my income is very inconsistent. Would it be a good idea to invest in stocks or in bonds? Well, the, uh, first, I'll make sure that, again, especially when the income is inconsistent, that you have saved up enough to withstand uh, time when you're not working. So six months at the minimum, I would keep in cash, no matter what. And the balance of cash, if it's still there, I'll just separate into some in stocks, some in bonds. Take an assessment, I mentioned. Uh, the assessment uh, is like a risk tolerance assessment that says how much of money percent is a percentage you're willing to put in the fluctuating world to look for opportunities. And let's say it's 50%, just for the sake of numbers. 50 and 50, and then you keep stocks and bonds at 50 ratio, regardless of what happens in the marketplace. If market goes up, 50-50 is no longer 50-50, 60-40, shave it off, make it 50-50, you, you kept the uh, profit in your hand. And when market drops, take bonds and buy more of the equities, again, to make 50-50, just by focusing on ratios, you're selling high and buying low. Don't try to make money, go after the process that makes money. 
making money comes as a byproduct. Thank you. Right here in the middle, a question. Hi, Andrew. My name is Vas. Uh, Hi, Vas. I was, I was wondering, your uh, strategy and your philosophy looks pretty similar to me as Dave Ramsey, if you heard that uh, Christian author educator. So, um, but how about credit cards? Are you suggesting people kind of, they can use them, can't use them? What your take on that? That's the first question. Another question is about, um, it's umbrella insurance. Is this law is really active in all um, US states or it's just like in California that let's say people hit you or you hit somebody, right? And um, you're kind of required to pay like for whole life whatever, mm -hmm. if they yeah. choose to do this process and stuff. Yeah, so liability exposure everywhere. Uh, we live in such a litigious world nowadays. Uh, people try to sue everybody for everything and nothing. So if there's a way that they, they look at you as a money printing press, that they could get money out of you throughout your life, they will, they will sue you. Um, again, depends how hungry they are, how ruthless they are. But the likelihood is if you're young and you're making money, they will go after your income, okay? In terms of credit cards, yeah, everybody should have credit cards. I have, I don't know how, how many credit cards, American Express, right? So, but don't use card if you don't have cash. The card is just ease of purchases, right? So you, uh, you don't have to travel with cash and you get points and then you could go to Ukraine with, I have, uh, 150,000 uh, miles in points, so that's what I'm going to use next time. So it's great to, to have credit cards, but if you don't have cash to pay the bill that month, <laughs> the credit card is, 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 should be off limits. Then ch change, change your perspective on, on that. Like a question, if you have some savings and you still have debt as a mortgage, is it better to pay off some part of mortgage? Will it drop down the monthly payment or do some savings instead of? There's such a thing as a cost of money. Uh, money has a cost to it, right? And there's loss opportunity cost to it as well. So when you lose a dollar, you don't just lose a dollar, you, you lose what that dollar could have made. Right? So you need to compare cost. What, what's your mortgage rate right now? Pardon me? 3.7. 3.7. That's what she said. So that's 3.7 that the bank charges, but it's not actual the cost to you, right? So the bank charges to you 3.7, but if it's a big, especially the beginning of mortgage life, the government, the United States, gives you a write-off in taxes, right? You submit your interest that you paid in, and depending on how much in taxes you're paying, let's say one third of it goes to taxes, take 3.7 minus one third, that's the actual cost of doing business with, with the mortgage company. So let's say it's two and a half percent, right? So 3.7 is charge, 2.5 is actual cost. Then you look at your cash and see how hard is my cash working for me? Nowadays, you could put in six months CD, probably make like 5%. Now, this is very temporal. Uh, we don't have that. It, it is a typical, right? Typically, you make it half percent to a percent. So right now, it doesn't make sense to take account that makes five to pay down the debt that is two and a half, right? The math doesn't work that way. Now, remember I said there's good debt and bad debt. So typically, mortgage is a good debt, especially 3.7 is a good debt. Now, if you have enough cash to, uh, to cover your emergencies for the next six months, there's balance left. I would invest that and still pay off your house. To do that is this. Banks do not just take monthly payments. Banks will take anything you give them. <laughs> they will take your firstborn son if you give them, right? So the idea is there. You take cash, invest next five to 10 years, while the 
the curve of deductibility. It's at the bell curve. If you, if you chart it out, the interest that bank charges, it's not a straight line going down. It's the bell curve. First 15, 20 years, that's where it's loaded with interest. I would use that for write-offs. I use my cash invested. And then 10 years, take the cash and bring to the bank. And you pay paid the debt off. Because house will appreciate regardless if you, there's debt or not. And if house goes down and you pay the debt off, remember 2008? Who would be better off? A person with a pink slip to the house or a person with the cash that could pay the, the house off at that time? We know when, when the equity uh, went down and houses start be, uh, depreciating so, so fast, then you could have taken that cash and buy two or three houses at the same time. So that's the kind of elongated answer that cost of money is important. If your money could make something more than the actual cost of a loan, then don't pay that off. And again, with mortgages, first portion of its life, since it's loaded with interest, I would just keep it on the books to get write-offs. And later on, you still could accomplish the same thing, pay off your debt, but lump sum. All good? Or is this a question? No, I think we're all good. Okay. All right, so let's give a round of applause to Andrew. Thanks for coming out. Um, Andrew, will you, will you be able to stay a little bit after in case people have absolutely. questions? Yeah, um, if you guys were nervous or didn't want to ask a question, you're welcome to ask him um, after the service, as well as, I know, Andrew, you had business cards. If anyone was interested in learning more about him, his practice, what he does, um, you're welcome to get one of the business cards. Um, so very technical, right? Lots of information. You're welcome to wind back the live service. I might do that a little bit later and try to study a little bit and learn a little bit. Um, but right, we're talking about financial health. Very practical today from Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, so that concludes our service. Why don't we stand up and pray and then please don't rush home. You're welcome to hang out, talk to Andrew, hang out with your friends outside. Uh, we'd be happy to get to know you. Uh, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you for this wonderful evening that we've had. We thank you that uh, we are able to come here, Lord, that we're able to gain that knowledge financially, Lord. Um, there's so much information out there. There's so much um, information that might skip by that we don't understand, Lord, but we, we thank you that we have leaders that can come into our church. We thank you that we're able to pursue this knowledge from um, seasoned experts, Lord, that's, that are Bible-based and we're able to learn more about our finances and learn more how those finances can serve the church, can serve for your glory, Lord. We thank you for everyone that was able to come. We pray for this upcoming week that everything goes well, Lord, and uh, be with us as we disperse. Amen.